Hey guys, welcome back. Let's get zone serious. Another Friday, another video. Topic today is going to be everything, the basics at least, of assembly language for x86-64, including the ABI that we're going to be using, as well as syscalls and how they work for Linux and BSD at least. Okay, usual disclaimer, this is not an educational resource, so no learning allowed, don't do it. Now, what's a register? Now, in my opinion, Registers are leprechauns and they are very small and they live in the computer and they keep track of numbers using switches, which is cool, but it means they only can count to two, you know, off and on. And so if they want to have the number like three, they have to use two switches and they have to put in 11 in there. It doesn't make any sense, but they can figure it out. I can't. Anyway, for us, as far as we're concerned, a register is basically a processor wide global variable that you can use to do math. You can add numbers in registers, you can put values from memory in registers, you can put values from registers into memory, and pretty much like all of assembly programming is just going to be using registers to move numbers around. So, yeah, and one key detail is that it has to be shared. So, RAX is a register that has to be shared across all functions, and so you have to be careful. You know about what you do with it at any given moment because it's, it's not just yours in your program but it's also being used by other functions that you're calling inside your program so you have to keep that in mind on x64 you have 64 what am i saying so you have 16 <laughs> general purpose registers not really you have 15 so it doesn't really count in my opinion um and these can be used for all that math stuff i mentioned before and the cool thing is is that you can use parts of the register too the, i mean the full one is 64 bits but you can also use the low 32 bits right here, or even some of them 16 bits and eight bits. I think for all of them, you can do that. And uh, yeah, so that's useful if you wanna just perhaps save some file size. Some instructions for you know the, the computer have shorter encodings. Like if you use a certain register with a certain size, it might be smaller than using a larger one. And we'll talk about that in a future video, but keep that in mind. Now, into the ABI. So what's an ABI? I have no idea. I think it stands for like application binary interface. I'm not sure. Um, basically, it's a series of rules that you have to, well, you're supposed to follow when you write software that's supposed to be supported by, you know, everything else with the system file ABI. And so people that do Unix systems or Unix-like stuff like Linux, BSD, Mac, Solaris, they're like usually try to keep following the system file ABI. Um, they don't do a very good job some of the time, but they do a pretty good job most of the time. And it's a very boring stuff, but like Lizzie McGuire said, but the, the most important part is the calling convention. That describes like, basically if you call a function, let's say you call printf or you call square root or you call hypotenuse something, right? It describes when you call that function, how the registers and the stack are allowed to change with in the function call. So once you're done with the function, if you want it to be compatible, it has to end up a certain way Otherwise, it's not gonna be compatible with the rest of the ABI. And that's fine, as long as you're smart enough and you can keep track of what you did, but if you're like me and you're very dumb, you can't keep track, and you're supposed to follow an ABI. That's the point. All the other rules are useless, so screw the ABI except for this one, one part. Now, Joe Biden has a good question here. What if I don't follow a calling convention? Good question, Joe. Here's a good example for you. So let's say you had two drivers. Um, the red driver says, I have to driven nearby the rightmost curb of this two-way roadway, and the yellow car says, me drive on left, and of course they crash. Why? Because they follow different conventions. And so calling conventions save lives and lower insurance premiums. Basically, if it enables you to make sure that you follow the rules that someone else is following, so when you, when you call their code, they don't mess with your registers, basically. And so now I'll look into the ABI directly and I'll show you some key fe some key features that are, are pretty cool. So let me pull that up. Um, so here is, yeah, ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. I guess I guessed right. Um, and this is an old one, but it hasn't changed really since then as far as I could tell, at least not what I was looking at. Um, and there's everything is in here that you could ever imagine. You got like function calling, you know, exceptions, page size, stuff like that, the initial stack, etc. I'll go through a few different examples here that I thought were interesting. So the first thing that's of value is this register usage table, figure 3.4, that describes how those 16 registers and some other ones are supposed to be used. And so we're not gonna use any of these down here. 
And today we're not going to talk about these. These are floating point registers, so ignore all of those for the time being. We're only talking about REX through R15. And so for these registers, you can see um, RDI is used for the first argument to function. So let's say you're computing the square, well, that's not a good example, but let's say you're computing like, uh, so you have a print function and you want to pass a file descriptor into that function and it's the first parameter, it would be in RDI, right? Second parameter in a function would go into RSI, third would go into RDX, then RCX, then into RA and R9. So if you have six parameters, they go into the registers. If you have more, they go on the stack. You can read about how that works. We'll talk about that later. Then you have um, return values. So in this case, you have two return values. Typically you only use one, but you have one in RAX and you have one in RDX. So the first return value goes in RAX and then in RDX. Usually that's not useful. I can see some use cases, right? Maybe you wanted to have maybe an error value come out in RAX and then the actual result in RDX. Let's say you had a, a vector of integers and you wanted to find the maximum and also its location. Maybe you put the maximum in, RD, in RAX and the location in RDX. Maybe that's an option. Typically, I don't return two values. I see, I see ways that you would want to, but I don't usually do that. In general, I just I use data structures and we'll use that more in the series than this. But either way, you do have 128 bits of returning capability out of a function in this ABI. And if you want to add more, if you want to use RCX as a return register, you can do that. If you want to use R10, you can do that, but that's up to you to define your own calling convention. Last thing I want to mention, oh, here's the stack pointer. We don't use that really. That's just for the stack, um, is what it's called uh, callee saved. You'll see that whenever it has the word callee saved, it also says yes, right? So um, callee saved, yes. Where did I see it? Callee saved, yes. Callee saved, yes. All those registers are callee saved. What that means, I'll talk about in a minute. It just means that in this case, they are preserved across a function call. So you don't have to worry, if you call a function, you don't have to worry about that register changing values in that function. Next thing I wanna talk about is this process stack. We'll look here in the next video um, more closely, but basically certain things are passed in to the program on the stack, including the arguments. So if you had command line arguments, they'll pass in at or near RSP. We'll talk about that in the next video. And the last thing was the stack. And so I'm not gonna cover the stack in great detail. In this video, I have one slide I think on it. Basically all you have to know is that it grows downwards and whenever you push values onto the stack, it grows down by that size and uh, you can pop values back off the stack if you want to restore values to registers later on. You can use it for extra parameters. You can use it for like, it has a red zone, meaning you can use a certain number of uh, bytes for certain things. People use that for like printing short strings, you can put them on the stack and then print them, that kind of stuff, you know, it, it it's useful for. We'll talk about that more in future videos. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go back to our slideshow. So back to what is a callee versus caller save register. So I made, I got this professionally commissioned by an artist. Um, here's how this, this lays out in an example. So, this green guy says, hey, it's time to change my fishbowl water. I'll leave Goldie, my goldfish, in this bucket while I change the water. Oh no, something else came up. Hey, Red, can you fill this bowl with fresh water while I check on the Tina's pizza rolls in the oven? Red says, yeah, of course I can. First thing Red does is he takes the bucket and pours out whatever green left in there. Oh, I need this bucket. I'll me pour out what's in here. I'll use it myself. Then he fills the bucket with fresh water. And then he uses that bucket of fresh water to fill the bowl. Great job, Green will be pleased. No, he won't be pleased, pleased. you just flushed his friend. So this is a good like deep philosophic question, right? Whose job was it to save Goldie? Let me know in the comments. In my opinion, it was Red's job because this Red guy is a total jerk. He just flushed a perfectly good goldfish. But I can see arguing for Green being the, the responsible one too, because he could have taken Goldie, he could have put him in a in a big gulp container or you know a extra large McDonald's like cup and put him on the shelf and kept him safe. But no, he left him in the bucket that he knew full well that Red was going to use. So I can see an argument both ways whose fault it was. But either way, this is Callie versus Caller Save Register. No, if you said it was Red's job to save Goldie, 
that would mean that red would have said, okay, hmm, there's a goldfish in my bucket. I'm going to take that. That would be a call E saved. I'm going to take whatever's in the bucket. I'm going to put it in a coffee cup. And I'm going to use this bucket to fill the bowl. And then when I'm done, I'm going to get the coffee cup, empty it back in the bucket, and give the bucket and the filled bowl back to green. Now, if you said it was a caller saved register, if it was green's job, that would be green coming along and saying, hmm, I know full well that red is going to use my bucket. And so I'm going to take Goldie out of the bucket and put him in a something else, <laughs> in, a, in a basin, in the sink, I don't know, with the drain up. Then red can use the bucket and fill the bowl and give the bucket back to me. And once red is done, I'll take Goldie out of the sink or out of the basin back in the bowl or back in my bucket and put it back in the bowl, right? That's how that would work. And so you can see the difference between the two. In code, it looks more like this. And so I mentioned before, this is kind of like a, 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 mass, uh, a MATLAB C-like syntax. Basically, registers are um, processor-wide globals. So they're defined outside functions. And so with this, basically, this has only one, one function being executed, which is, well, one main function being, it's like printf. So it prints out a, a number. That number is the result of function that uses RDI to compute something important with an input of three. And you saw the calling convention where RDI was the first parameter, and so three is passed into RDI when you call that function, and that function will return an integer in Rx, and you can print that out with percent %d. That's how this whole thing works. And so this subfunction um, takes input parameter three, and then it just seemingly just calls another function and gets a value for Rx. It adds RDI, which was an input, into Rx, and then it returns Rx. And that's that would seemingly work. Unfortunately, it won't work. Why? Because this is a processor-wide global variable. And so if you look at the subfunction, which is some other function which takes no inputs, it's still tampered with RDI. You see RDI was set to 5 and RSI was set to 2. And so even though you passed in 3 to the function, the moment that this function is called, RDI is set to something else. You could have set RDI to a million at this point. Once it gets to here, it's back to five. So yeah, it computes the sum of that, which would be seven, puts it into Rx for the addition, but the problem was it messed up RDI. And so at this point, what is it? Rx would just evaluate to what, 12? Where you thought it was gonna evaluate to uh, three plus seven is 10. So you now your result is wrong. And so how do you avoid this? Well, you use the stack. And that's how push and pop work. So there are two options. So the first option, let me cross the, the other option out while we're talking about this one. So ignore this. The first option would be the caller save. So this would be green, green's responsibility. So he's gonna take RDI, push it on the stack, call a function, because he knows he's gonna need RDI later. And he knows that it's very likely that this function is going to break RDI. It's going to clobber RDI. And so it's going to push onto the stack, then pop it off the stack when it's done, and do the math. And that will work perfectly fine. The other option would be not to do this. It would be to do a callee saved option. So that would be doing nothing in the main function, but then in the sub function, knowing full well that we're going to tamper with RDI and RSI. Let's just push them onto the stack first and then pop them off in reverse order when we're done, right? That would preserve the values as well. So there's two options. I'm more fond of this one in particular, but uh, you can have your opinions. So here's how the stack works with those two examples. So whenever you call a function, you basically push the return address, the address of the next instruction after that one was called onto the stack. So in this case, you have return address from the white function, then you've pushed RDI. This is for the caller saved option, the first one. And then you have return address for the sub function. And so the stack pointer points to the lowest element here in the stack and it follows it along. So as you get into the yellow function, you return back from it, then you restore RDI and you return from the main function as well. So this is how that one works. Um, you can follow along, you know, more closely with the debugger if you're curious. 
and uh, the caller call lead state option is a little bit different. Basically, you don't push anything onto the stack, but in the white function, you only do it in the yellow function. And remember, you've pushed RDI and then RSI. So when you're done, you pop RSI first, then RDI, then you return from this address, then you return from this address. So that's or sorry, return to this address and then this address. So that's how that works. They're pretty much the same thing. Um, there's no real difference. I think that this one is a little bit more more pure, in my opinion, a little bit easier to use, a little bit nicer, user friendly for someone that's just programming and not someone that's making a huge like software library. Um, so we're gonna use our own custom, I said ABI here, but it should be, I guess, a common convention where we're just going to change a few things. It should be compatible mostly with System 5, but it may not be, I'll, I'll leave that on the table for now. Um, so we're gonna be extremists. We're gonna make everything, all registers that are not return values, call these saved. So everything here is gonna be yes, except if you return a value in REX, then REX is gonna obviously change. If you use REX and RDX, then those can both change. So everything that's not return value will be preserved. So it'll make programming a lot, a lot easier. Again, we're not gonna use um, boring registers like these ones in our code. This is for like the old floating point stuff and the new floating point stuff. I like the, the middle floating point stuff, the XM registers. I don't like this huge stuff. So yeah, we're gonna do just the kind of like the basics of modern floating point. And so this ABI, this, this calling convention is gonna be pretty much objectively worse. Because if you look, we have to push and pop every register all the time onto the stack that we're gonna be using. And that's gonna add file size. It's gonna add execution time. It's gonna make our code slower and bigger, which is not good. But it will also be easier to use. And if we're smart about it, it may not be all that much slower or bigger. And I'll show you why in a couple of seconds. And um, why is it easier to use? It's because let's say you had a, a function where you were calling a bunch of functions and all those functions took the same parameter. Let's say you had RDI was seven for all these functions, but those functions were all tampering with RDI. Well, then you have to constantly be moving RDI, moving the value seven into RDI before you call that function. And that gets a little unwieldy when you have a, a bunch of functions with the same parameters. And yeah, it's just a lot easier to expect that all registers are preserved with the possible exception of return registers. So yeah, that's why it's better and worse. It's mostly worse, but also a bit better. So here's a good example of, uh, of a function that we're gonna make in our own ABI. And so here's how I write functions in assembly. I kind of put like a comment, that's just what this colon means, semicolon means a comment. It's how I define functions. I always put the return value type where it is, in brackets. I always put my registers in brackets. I don't, I don't know why. Obviously I forgot for this just to save space, but the function is called add up three numbers and it takes three inputs. They're all longs and they're in RDI, RSI, RDX. So they follow the ABI. They follow the convention system five. Then you have this thing here. This is a label. This refers to this address in memory. This instruction push is at address add up three numbers. This could, this could be address 67. So if you, if you ever jump to address 67, you'll jump to this instruction. Or if you call this instruction, it will do two things. It will push the return value of where you were, and then it will jump here. So that's that. Um, this function, again, just adds up three numbers, symbol. Uh, it pushes three registers onto the stack, and pushes three out. These are all the input registers, right? RDI, RSA, RDX. But let's look at the math, right? And again, we popped them off in the reverse order. So RDX was the first to pop off. It was the, it was the last to push on. So look, look at the math though. The first thing that happens was we take, this is an add instruction. So we're taking the value in RDX and adding it into the, into the value in RSI and it stays in RSI. So here's how that looks. RSI equals RSI plus RDX. The next thing takes the value in RSI adds that to RDI. At this point, you have RDI equals RDI plus the new value in RSI, which was RSI plus RDX. So now RDI contains the entire sum, yeah? And last thing is you take the value in RDI and you move it into RDX. And remember, RDX was our return value, and so we can now pop everything and return. That's how sort of this whole system is set up. 
and this is fine. However, you'll notice that when in assembly, at least in the Intel syntax, I think that's what we're using, these are the registers that are destination, and these ones are the source, meaning these will never change. RDX, RSI, RDI are not changing in this part of the instruction, but RSI, RDI, and RX are changing. So in reality, we didn't, remember, we, we changed RSI here, we changed RDI here, and we changed RX here, but we never actually changed RDX. So you can get rid of this instruction entirely. You don't need this instruction. It's useless. It pushes a value that we didn't change. Now, in addition, so that's how, you might think that it's so bad. Wow, look how slow this is, like, having to push pop everything at the same you know, all the time it might be slow but the problem is if you don't change registers you don't have to do that you don't need to you don't need to do these things next this algorithm is just trash i mean why are we adding up things like this if we did the computation in the return value we could remove all of this and that's what this is on the right hand side so the first thing is we move the value in rdi into rx you can see then we're incrementing it basically we're adding um RSI to it, and we're adding RDX to it, and they're returning. So again, in this case, we were able to implement this instruction, this uh, this function, without any pushes and pops. Yet we still follow our ABI, our calling convention. So it's not all going to be always worse. Okay, next topic is syscalls, system calls. That's how we make the OS do things that we can't do on our own. Like we don't have the ability to write files without the system. So the kernel can read files, write files, open and close files for us. Remember, printing to files is a write construction as well as reading from files. That's how you read from standard in. That's, you know, that's the same thing. Um, file permissions, also a syscall. Stopping our program is a syscall. That's our topic today is gonna be stopping our program and some other stuff as well. Here's a good depiction. You know, we are this Arab slave master. Our program is the whip he's using, that we're using. The kernel is the slave for us, and the syscalls what we're forcing it to do, in this case, the wheat in the background. So very simple depiction and very accurate about how this is working out. Now, there are different syscalls on different OSs. On Linux and BSD, there's a there's a pretty good cor you know, correspondence between the two. Like, they pretty much correspond. Um, and this guy has a website called uh, the Linux FreeBSD Syscall Concordance, and you can check it out if you're curious. Um, basically, it kind of just tabulates what is the same and different between the two. And um, here are a couple of the major ones that we're going to use in this series. So you got read, write, open, close, exit, and change mod, ch mod. Um, you now it's reading files, writing files, opening files, closing files, ending the process, and changing permissions for a file. And on Linux, here are the numbers. We got 0, 1, 2, 3, 60, 90. And then there are more between them. I just skipped them for this, for this slide. And on FreeBSD, they have different numbers. So you have 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 15. Again, um, you know, the, the order is different. The numbers are different, but this, they're pretty much the same instruction. You'll see that the parameters are here in this column. And the parameters look different, right? You see unsigned int file descriptor for read for Linux. On BSD, it's int file descriptor. On Linux, the buffer that you're reading bytes into is, is a character pointer called user or sorry, it's a character um, pointer called buffer. On Linux, it's a void pointer called buffer. It's the same thing, just a different name. And lastly, you have the number of bytes is called count of size T on Linux, and it's n, n byte on uh, FreeBSD. So a different name, but it's the same thing in the same order, which is all that matters, because how you use it is like this. You put the syscall number in RIX, and then you put the parameters following the system five ABI. So you put the first parameter in RDI, next parameter in RSI, etc. So that's how that works. And then all you do is you call the syscall instruction. So you put the values in RX and RDI that you need in RSI and RDX, and whatever. You call syscall and it will execute automatically. You don't have to do anything. The OS developers already programmed all this stuff for you that you can use. So it's like a library, but um, it's a library that you actually need because you can't do this stuff the kernel won't let you. You don't have the, the right authority to do these kind of things. So um, one last thing about this is the syscall instruction. There are a few instructions like this is that they clobber registers. So RCX and R11 are going to change. So if you care about preserving those, in which case, you know, we, we do, um, you have to preserve them because they're going to change during the function, during the syscall, during the kernel call, it's going to change. 
Um, and so you would do that. Again, we would always do that, except for exit, because exit as a function doesn't, um, that syscall doesn't ever return because it just exits the program, right? So you don't actually have to save registers in our ABI in the exit syscall, you know, whenever you use to call that, just because it's, you know, it's not going to be useful because it's going to leave. The program's going to end, so who, who cares? And our last thing to cover here is a completely exhaustive assembly language tutorial for x86. Um, and here's how it looks. Now, this is the old architecture. You can tell it's old because it has, you know, the the coprocessor, you know, floating point stuff, which we're not going to use in this series. We're going to use a little bit more um, modern stuff than that. But this is pretty accurate otherwise. Um, so most instructions in x86, 64 still are... Well, they say it's a move instruction. I would argue that the most common instruction is a NOP instruction, which doesn't do anything. It's just used for padding and putting space in your code, making it align properly. Um, but yeah, move is the most common instruction by far. Over one third of all instructions are going to be moves. Move is basically move values from memory to registers, from registers to memory, from immediates to registers, between registers, that kind of stuff. They can move values around. One thing it can't do is it can't move values from memory to memory and it's interesting as to why that is, if you think about the encoding, but I'll leave that for you on your own. Then, so that's move. Let me cross them out as we go. Push and pop, we already covered. Those use the stack to save values. Call and return. That's how you enter a function. That's how you leave a function. Okay. Then let's go to add and subtract. Those are just an increment. Let's do what you think. Add adds things together. Subtract subtracts them. An increment increases it by one. Um, Compare and test, those basically set flags. So one, of the, we'll talk about this later, but one of the big things in, um, like when you have loops and stuff and conditionals is you have to have a, like, like say you had if A is greater than six. Well, how does that actually work on the processor? Did you ever think about that? Well, basically you're doing a comparison or in some cases a test and you can test if, them, if they are the same or if they're greater and you can set certain flags to use for conditional operations to come. So in this case here, you can see there's jump equal and jump not equal. Those are two conditional jump instructions. Also, there's jump below, jump greater than or equal to, jump above, right? There's different ways to formulate this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, either way, it uh, can compare and test set flags and then conditional jump uses those flags to jump. And then jump was our entire video one in this series. That was our infinite loop. That's how you jump to addresses. And it's a very common instruction. I would say it's the most important instruction in, in assembly language because it's the entire you know, control flow of your program is, is in that. XOR, add, and, sorry, XOR, and, and or, those are what you think. They just do, do operations. We're not gonna use these two. We'll talk about floating point in a future video. Um, shift left and shift right, just move register values, that number of bits. So you can do shift left, rex three, that would move it to the left by three and infill zeros. So, yep. And the last thing here is LEA. I pretty much never use LEA. I know what it does. I think I've used it once or twice. Um, it's used for array indexing. You can use it for fancy math tricks. Um, I think that's what the compiler uses it for mostly. Um, but we're not going to use it all that much. When, when we do use it, I'll put it out to you, but not important really all that much. Um, and then other things as well that you know you might use are in the other. So there you go. You covered pretty much 90% of all assembly language in just you know a few minutes. For everything else, including these things, check out this guy's website. Let me get rid of those. Um, I'll show you it right now. Basically, he has a listing from the Intel manual that he tabulated really nicely with the script and it looks pretty cool. Let me open it up for you. Four. Now you know my hotkey to change windows. Um, here, so I just saw shift left somewhere. Shift left. Here's shift left. You can see a shift lefts, in this case, register or memory. I didn't know you could do that by two. Okay, that's cool. No, it multiplies it by two, shifts it one, right, etc. Interesting, I didn't know you could do that. Good to know. Anyway, you know, there's, you know, push and pop are gonna be here, right? Push, you got um, move SD. This is a 20 point instruction that, you know, you use for that. Um, everything you'd see here, add, right? Oops, too many ads. I should put a space. Add, here's add. Yeah, so all the things, you could click on them and see how they work. 
and everything else you could ever be curious about is on this site. I highly recommend. It's much better than the stupid manual. Manual sucks. Um, with that out of the way, let's go back to this. So now we're going to do examples. So um, I have some examples that cover the basics of assist calls and most of these instructions, not all of them, but most, to give you an idea of, of how they work. I'm not going to go into great detail because you can always read the manual, um, but just to give you a feel for how this stuff works. So yeah, let me let me show you this. Make sure you can see it. So I have a couple of examples here. So I have a um, I have an example two A. So this example this is video two. So example two A is the way that we're going to use a syscall to terminate our executable. Right, that's just the basics. Example two B. That's going to be the same thing, just with a function and not uh, doing it manually. And the last thing is going to be a vector sum that will kind of incorporate a lot more of the assembly language instructions that you need to know to write programs in x86 assembly. So that out of the way, let's open up the 2A. Oops, let's make sure I got everything here. Have everything extra? Okay, so let's open up everything. And so what I've got here is the same header as before, as episode one. All of the bytes are the same, I didn't change anything. What I've got is I have a single include. We're gonna include this listing, which by the way, doesn't include any assembly language, it just has de definitions. And then we have a couple of lines of code here. Before you get into this, let me get into what this syscall listing is. So let me open up um, this. So basically, um, we're going to use a, like a, a bash script to, to evaluate whether you're on BSD or on Linux. And if you're on FreeBSD, it will include this directory. If you're on Linux, it will include this directory. And so you won't have to worry about manually changing things here and there. If you download the code on FreeBSD or Linux, it should just, if, if it fits your ships, it should just work, you know? So on FreeBSD here, this is called defined using the define macro thing, or whatever. That, that syntax uh, on, uh, on NASM means you can define a value into a, a string. And so on FreeBSD, we have these definitions. On Linux, we have these definitions. I won't get into the details. These are for future videos. Um, these are ones we're gonna use, you know, upcoming. With that out of the way, let me go back to the the code. And so that's what this is. This is includes that listing. So now you have a bunch of strings that you can use. And if you're on FreeBSD, like I am, it will it will use that whenever you call six exit, it will call, put the right value in there. If you're on Linux, it will use the other value, right? I think on Linux it was, um, hold on. On Linux it was 60 for exit. On FreeBSD, I think it was one. So we'll pull different value for different OS. Okay. So all we're doing here is we're moving that syscall number from that table, remember that table we showed, um, into REX like we're supposed to. Actually, let me show you that while I'm, while I'm here. Might as well. We're putting the syscall number, in this case, uh, 60 or one on FreeBSD into REX. And then we put the return value or the error code on Linux is the same thing um, into RDI, right? That's the first parameter. And so if I go back, you can see we've put 1969 into, into that. So that's the year of the first faked moon landing, but you know, there are a couple other ones as well. And then we're, we're gonna call the syscall instruction or I shouldn't say call, that's not very good to say. We're gonna use the syscall instruction to execute that system call. And so this should return 1969 to our console. And how does that work? Well, if you if you ever if you've ever known, if you if you echo out um, this, <coughs> this returns the output value, output value of the previously executed command. Um, so that's how you can check the return values of things that aren't printing to the screen. So we're going to use that. If I execute that, oh, sorry, let me show you that. Um, let me show you that run.sh. Basically, you can see it includes different, if you're on Linux, it will put in Linux here. If you're on FreeBSD, it'll put FreeBSD in here. So that's why it's kind of cross-platform. Um, so yeah, if we run our code, 
Again, this is gonna assemble it with NASM, change it to executable, and then execute it. And now if we echo out the result, wait, it was supposed to say 1969, what's with, with this garbage? Well, it's because it only executes, it only returns the low byte. So yeah, this is the low byte of that number, if you're curious. Anyway, that out of the way, let's go example 2b. This is the same thing, it's just gonna be with um, a function call. So here you can see we've included syscalls once again. We also have another include, and that is lib slash sys slash exit. And let me show you how that works. Here's exit. Um, and this is how we can define functions, at least how I do it. I always put if not defined. This basically means if I've not already included this file, let's say I had 10 different files and they all included this file, well, this would only work if it was not yet defined. And so this is basically to make sure you don't include something more than once. You'll have multiple things with the same label otherwise, so that won't work. And so yeah, all programs that I'm gonna write, all functions I'm gonna write are gonna have, um, it's at the top, if not defined, then the name of the function, define the name of the function, and then end that if. So here's how it works. You have an exit label. This is the address in memory, just like start was, remember start. This is the address in memory of this function. And so if we call exit, it will, it will jump here to this address. And then all it does is it exits the program with the return value in the low byte of RDI unsigned. So it, RDI already is gonna contain that low byte return value. And then we're just gonna move REX. We're gonna move into REX, the sysexit syscall number, which on Linux would be different than for BSD. And then we call syscall. So it's the same exact thing, just in a function and not in the software itself, or not in the, the main program itself. And so if I go back, make sure you can see. Um, yeah, we move 69 into the low byte of, of RDI, and you could do RDI here if you want, but I'm just gonna refer to the low byte as DIL, which is you know what it's called, um, but it would work the same. Um, it might be a little bit smaller to do it this way. I'm not sure, we could check that if, you, if you're curious, and then we call exit. So let's let's do that, let's, um, let's run this, and let's echo the output. 69, so it worked. It was a low byte, so it worked. Now, let me look at the file size of that. That was, this is all live, by the way. I've, I've not prepared this. Uh, so the code, uh, the binary was 135. If I go back in there, I'm just curious if it's gonna change. If I go back in the code.asm and I change this to RDI, is it gonna change the file size? Yep, so it's two bytes more. So yeah, we just saved two bytes by using DIL and not RDI. So let me change that back before I forget. <laughs> you just saved two bytes, dude. Tell your mom. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go to the third example. That was example C, vector sum. Let's check what we got here. So in this case, I have three includes. I have the syscall include, I have exit, and this is how we're gonna be returning values until we can print things, that will be in a video or two. We'll talk about how to print things to the screen, that's actually not very easy. And um, our other include is this lib slash math slash int slash packed sum, whatever that means. It's a function that I just wrote that uh, will compute the sum. I'll show you the function right now, actually. So here it is. Again, we have the same if not def, define, and if, you know. And by the way, I should have also put something here. I should have put in a line here. Now that I'm thinking about it. I should put a line 64 here or something like that. But I'll, get, I'll, I'll do that in another video. I'll show you how that works. Um, so yeah, we have our, our function called packed sum. What it does is it computes the sum of RDI packed sign longs starting at the address RSI. And so RSI points to the first address in memory of the first element of the array. And RDI is the number of elements in the array and all the elements are longs. So here's how it works. Because we are possibly, and in fact we are, tampering with RDI and RSI, I first push them onto the stack. This is our API, our own personal schizone API, call convention. We're pushing these values on the stack and popping them off at the end. 
and then returning at the end. And I have a label at the end called done that we can use to jump to if we ever want to jump to the end. Now, one thing I want to mention is that if you ever put a dot in front of a label, this is a label, it means an address. This might be address 20,006, right? This would be a different address. Now, the dot means that you can use this same word somewhere else. You can't use the word packed sum 10 times in your code, but you can use dot loop or dot packed sum. Why? Because this basically means packed sum dot loop. It basically means from the last you know real label, this is like a sub label. And so whenever you have internal like addresses that you're you want to you know jump to or use for loops and stuff or for you know leaving the code or whatever you're doing whenever you have you know control flow inside of a, a, a function always start the label with a dot otherwise you'll have like conflicting labels if you use the word loop twice so pro tip there so the first thing that happens is i do this xor function XOR most of the time is not used for XOR. Usually it's used for setting a register to zero, which is also how XOR works. If you think about, you know, exclusive OR. Um, so when I say XOR REX REX, that just sets REX to zero. So the whole 64 bits are all zero. Then I have, oh, can you guys see, is this too small? Let me zoom in. Then we have RAX. We're gonna, oh, sorry, let me start here. Then I'm, so we made it zero. Now, RDI was supposed to contain the number of values in the array. So it could be seven, it could be a hundred. Let's check if it makes sense. If the array has zero numbers, you can't sum it up, right? It doesn't make any sense. If it has negative 53 numbers, it doesn't make sense. So it has to be at least, you know, one. So what we do is we use the compare instruction. We say compare RDI one, and then certain flags are set such that when you'd say jump below, that if RDI was below one, this jump will execute and we will jump to done, pop off the registers and return without summing anything. And our return value will be zero, right? Rx will be zero. And that will only happen if RDI was input with some bogus number. Now, if RDI was one or more, we don't wanna do this. And so this won't actually execute because it's not gonna be below one. And it will fall into this dot loop loop. And this is how loops work in assembly. You usually have like a, a condition that you're checking, and then you have a um, you know, operation that you're doing in the loop. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking the value at the address RSI. So this does not, this does not add the value in RSI to the value in RAX and put the value in RAX like it did in our previous example. This takes the value at the address in RSI and puts that in the register at RAX after you know adding it. So this will basically, we're gonna use this to add the value at the address in RSI to our running sum, which starts out to be zero, but it's gonna become non-zero after the first iteration, right? Then our next instruction is add RSI eight. This moves our pointer RSI to the next element. So if every element is a long, then every element is eight bytes. And so if we, if the first value was at address 16, the next one will be at address 24. So this will just allow us to push forward each time with a new element. Then decrement RDI, remember RDI was the number of numbers in our array. And so let's say it was five. Every time we execute the loop, let's try to keep track of how many numbers are left. So there was first five, but now there's gonna be four, then three, then two, then one. And decrement just does that. It subtracts one every time. And then when it hits zero, decrement also sets the flag. It sets the flag, so that the, you know, jump non-zero will jump to loop if it's non-zero. So if RDI was five, we'll jump to loop. If RDI is four, we'll jump to loop. If RDI ends up being three, loop. Two, loop. One, loop. Once RDI hits zero, this jump doesn't work anymore. This condition fails. It's no longer non-zero. Zero is not non-zero. So we'll fall out into done, and then you know we pop the registers and return. So this function, as you would expect, does everything for summing up packed ints in a vector. With that out of the way, let me go back into our code here and show you how this works. And we're getting to the end of this video, so we're almost done. A couple of things. Remember, we only have one 
block of code. Whereas the boomers, they like to have you know a data section and an instruction section, like dot code section. We had everything in the same section, and so we'll have instructions like move, move, call, right? Those are instructions. We'll have those in the same section as we have values. So this vector is a, is an address in memory, but it's not pointing to instructions like start and like packed sum and exit, those things point to instructions. This one points to a memory as well, but it's pointing to a number. It points to number 11. And so what we're doing here is we're defining, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six quad words, so eight bytes long each, numbers at address vector. First one being 11, then 14, 17, and so on. Now, what's our actual you know, instructions doing? First thing is we're putting the value six into RDI. This is the number of values in our array. Now we put the address vector into RSI, call packed sum. At this point, Rx will contain the packed sum of RDI elements at address RSI. And now we can return that value by moving that returned value into RDI. Remember, RDI was the return value for our sysexit, and then we can call exit as before. And so what this does, basically when we run this code and we say echo the previous result, this will output the sum of those six numbers. Long story short, so if we close this and we run it and we echo, 42. That was the sum of those six numbers. So. With that out of the way, we've covered the basics of assembly. You guys now pretty much know um, everything you need to know to do the basics of assembly programming. You know how to use syscalls, how to read files, write files, how to exit programs. You can look it up. Now you have resources to look it up. You know how the ABI works. You know how to in interface with other programs. You know how to interface with printf. You know how to interface with you know these timing functions if you really wanted to from assembly. And I've also gone over just the very basics of assembly instructions. And we'll get into a lot more detail in future videos, but I want to just leave it there for this video. It's already getting kind of long, 47 minutes. So with that out of the way, I hope you learned something. Um, actually, I hope you didn't. That was against the rules. I hope you did learn anything. Um, and if not, that's good. With that, I'll leave you guys and uh, have fun playing around with the code on the suppository. I'll see you around.